Um, this is a talk about an unexpected infrastructure management journey. Spoiler alert, this is not going to be the most technical talk you're going to have. It's mostly about life experiences, moments of laughter, crying, and some life lessons at the end. So let's get started. Hi. Uh, my name is Michaela, uh, but Mickey for short. So if you're not get, um, get in touch with me, please feel free. Um, I'm originally from Bulgaria, which is in Southeast Europe, for those of you whose geography is a bit poor. Uh, but I live in Edinburgh, Scotland. That kind of explains the accent, right? Um, and I've been there for 10 years. Um, and I'm a classically trained computer scientist. What that means is I had no idea what I was going to be doing um, and what the industry looks like after university. That was one big fat lie. Um, but um, what you need to really know is that I'm passionate about automation, all things automation. Um, it started from how, what's the quickest way to get my um, music venue tickets to uh, how do we speed up our um, code releases, how do we speed our testing, um, how do we uh, go into infrastructure at the end. But in general, I've, I've, done, I've been to, into multiple teams. That would be um, development, um, QA, uh, release management, um, even architecture at one point. Don't know how that happened. Um, but then um, the whole DevOps thing happened and that got my attention because one of the pillars of it is like tools and automation. And I was like, okay, well, what, what is that really? Um, and what is actually infrastructure automation? So I moved to an infrastructure operation team to do that kind of stuff. Well, I come from, from development background, Java mostly. So moving to operations was one of the um, questionable things in my mind. And you're going to find out why. Oh, a note. This is my first conference talk ever. And it's only the second time I'm speaking in public. So please be nice. <laughs> okay, so if we need to cover the stock in 60 seconds, and that is going to be like, okay, if this doesn't sound like something you want to hear, now is the time to walk. Uh, we're going to go through um, how do you get into infrastructure management land when you know almost nothing about it. Um, the adventure of a new job in operations. Uh, and the scary learning curve which comes with it. Uh, and when you're moving from development to operations, what do you take with you? Okay. Um, nobody's walking away, so that's a good sign. Okay, so um, why am I talking about this? Changing culture is harder than changing tech. Um, breaking, we, we all heard yesterday um, said talking about breaking silos. Well, it's, it's easier said than done. Um, adopting new tools and technologies um, doesn't resolve the problems. Um, in reality, development cares more about releasing new features, releasing them faster, satisfying customers. Well, from operation point, that's the new things I learned about and I wasn't familiar with before, is we care about having things stable, available, um, well, highly available and scalable. So those are like, they, these two can contradict. Um, but at the same time, operations aim to support the development teams, to support the business in the best way possible. And that in the, does include moving forward. And working together can be hard. Hand in hand, it's, it's hard. But if we don't do it, it's even harder later on. So this is a talk about some of those hurdles. Okay, for some of this to make sense, you need to know why I got into it. And that is, those would be my views as well as some of my colleagues' ones. And they might be applying to you too. I hope they do. Okay, first one. I hate repetitive tasks. This is the one thing which drives me insane. Um, if I need to do something more than twice, I'll see how I can automate it and make it faster. Um, it, it indicates that it has scope for improvement. Um, 
and yeah, aiming to automate the boring stuff so you can do the exciting ones. So that was one of the reasons for me. The need of various technologies. Well, I was a Java dev, and I did the moment of retrospective one year, asking myself, can I see myself doing that job for 20 years? No. No. Big bad no. So, and, and operations give me the, the ability to play with so many different things at the same time. Would that be databases? Would that be web servers? Would that be Kubernetes? Anything you can play with. It was great. And then I need a challenge. Um, otherwise, I get bored. Uh, I like getting myself out of my comfort zone. That's why I'm here. And the other thing is, I started looking at the trends. I was like, okay, DevOps is trending. I see, I see loads of people talking about it. What is it about? Um, research into it a little bit more. And I was like, oh, that is actually really cool. So, okay, cool. Oh. Interest and curiosity on how things work. Well, yeah, it's, it's fascinating to start tinkering and try and get to the bottom of actually what is happening behind the scenes. Um, and how, how for an example, um, um, sorry, uh, some of my colleagues and uh, friends um, are really into networks and um, some are into containers. For me, it's like, I want to know everything. I can't, but anyway. Um, so this one is one which came from my colleagues, actually, and friends. Some people just fall into infrastructure management and configuration management and DevOps. It's like it might be a natural progression to their career. It might be something that uh, gradually led one by one. And others just fill in the gap. If your organization... Um, just suddenly is left with nobody in operations, nobody doing, knowing what the, uh, your infrastructure is like, or nobody to support it. Well, somebody needs to step up the game. I had a friend who had to do that. Okay, so this is pretty much the list of some of the things um, which got me into infrastructure management. Um, and it was... Uh, more than I could, I, I bit more than I can chew, let's say it that way. So, you're going to find that out on the journey. So, okay, little by little, one can travel far. I mean, I started with Java, and now, well, I love my SQL, and yeah, it's weird. Uh, so, um, we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about uh, teams, the job, the projects, the failures, and we're going to have one little retrospective at the end. Um, it is going to cover day one from when I started the job in, as an operations person, and it's going to end, it's going to cover until um, month five or six. I don't remember exactly, that was two, three years ago now, two years ago. So. Yay, I'm starting a new job in a new team. And I'm going to be doing infrastructure stuff. Exciting. And I, when I joined the, the, the company and the organization, everybody was saying, oh, you're joining the most diverse team. Yes. <laughs> um, a hobbit between humans. It felt a little bit like that. Um, but to be fair, um, it doesn't look like the most diverse team, but in reality it is. Behind the scenes, uh, it was actually more diverse than you can think of. But I can have a whole talk just about that, uh, talking about um, background diversity, gender, nationality, location, culture. There are loads of those. And that team in particular, we had seven different nationalities, seven different cultures. Um, if you think uh, that is not important, let me tell you, in Bulgaria, when you're saying no, you do this. If that's not confusing, I don't know what is. So, yay, new team, great. Um, but what does that actually mean? It meant that I had to fit in into that team. I mean, they've been um, together for a while, and I'm the new face. 
And I'm like, okay, I, I really want to prove myself. I really want to learn everything. I know everybody that I can really do this and I can contribute. Even if I'm from dev background, it doesn't matter. I can do up stuff. And that I know them. Um, well, I was desperate to know the requirements of the job. Uh, and I found out later on that operations uh, doesn't have strict requirements guidelines, no matter what people think. So um, I was like so, so, so excited and so focused on me, 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 where am I, that I almost forgot that I needed to fit within a team. So I was really fortunate that I had uh, an amazing mentor who took me under uh, his wing and was like, okay, well, this is uh, how you provision uh, a web server and this is how you do um, automation for databases, etc." And was like, this is awesome. But uh, he, so he was amazing to show me, show me around. Um, but I realized at one point that every, every time a new person joins a team, it's a whole new team. The dynamic changes. There was no strict um, um, rules. Your position would move from one to another depending on um, who joins. So that was a, a new experience not only for uh, me but for my team as well because they had been working together for a while. And then I, I had to think, okay, well, how does everything fit into the job, how do I fit in, how does my, my team fit into the job, and what is the job? I mean, I'm trying to understand what does an operation person or infrastructure person does. Um, and I found out that it depends from company to company. Um, what might, be, might apply for, for Google, it doesn't necessarily apply for Microsoft. So I was like, okay, fine. And I needed to think of actually what do we deliver? That was all I needed to know. I mean, you're, I'm starting afresh here. I'm a newbie. Um, so do we provide products, uh, support for products, um, services? Or uh, do, we, do we just do maintain? Do we work on projects to scale? It was, uh, I was trying to get the, the gist of it and realizing that you're actually doing everything. Um, and then the other thing is, what, what do we, beside the job, what do we actually provide to the organization? I mean, what, what do they want from us? Uh, do they want some sort of metrics? Um, how, how, how does everything fit in together? Um, are you the only ops, ops team? Um, or are there multiple? Are you collaborating with each other or not? Um, and is the organization expecting features from your team, or is it expecting infrastructure reliability? Is it expecting five nines? I was like, okay, okay. Slowly, slowly. I had all of those questions in week one. A bit too much, really. So, um, what ended up happening was I would, I would get some of that information on an ongoing basis, rather than in one big lump, because you find out you discover new things like Easter eggs all the time. So the real breakthrough and that realization of uh, what an operations job can be like came through trial by fire. Um, so I got pulled into a room by my manager and he was like, well, you see, we have this um, project which is already um, half done. Um, uh, it's it's a, just a very simple project. It's going to be nice and easy. You just have to finish it off and deliver it. And I was like, awesome. Okay, I can totally do that. I mean, I, I really want to do this. I want to get my hands dirty. And I didn't ask any questions at all to what I'm going into, really. Um, that, was, um, that was roughly month uh, two to three into the job. So when my manager said, oh, it's just a simple project migration, I was like, awesome. And it only later on it occurred to me to ask, what does, what does it mean? Like, what is a project migration? OK, OK. So um, it was mostly about um, migrating one product 
to, from one infrastructure to another. Um, and I was like, okay, well, what can I identify? Where should I even start from this? It's like, they're just giving it to me. The person who is already working on it decided that he, he needs to be involved in something else and they're giving it to the newbie. It, it can't be that bad, right? Um, so, oh, did I mention it's a live product? And um, not under active development. So um, I'm not going to go as far as saying abandoned in production, um, but close. <coughs> so I was like, okay, okay, let's get started. Okay, let's start with the project planning and see, okay, what has already been done? And I ended up repeating the same exercise that the person before me has already done. And realizing, well, actually, I've, it, it was supposed to be just simple lift and shift. We know how those go now, right? So, okay, starting on the project planning bit, uh, to migrate it and gathering um, all the information, um, doc documents, talking to all the engineers, everybody involved, and um, yeah, it seems to me that has already been done my colleague, by my colleague, but when you, when you get, hand over somebody a project, you, you don't just hand them over the project. You, you hand them all the responsibility, all the connections, and there is some hard work going on there. Um, and then you realize actually um, that your product is actually, uh, the migration is happening across multiple territories. Yeah, that was multiple time zones too. And um, different vendors as well. That was uh, an interesting piece of information. I got told uh, a little bit later on in the project because everybody assumed that I had that knowledge. I mean, I'm doing the job, right? So, um, and it did highlight the fact that, well, our documentation on legacy, or sorry, not under active development products um, is uh, <laughs> not very good. Especially when the product has been out uh, and available for a while now. So, yay. And I then discovered that there is this little piece of uh, requirement as part of the project. Minimal downtime. So, I started asking my managers and my teams, well, what is minimal downtime? How do you define that? And, he, and they're like, well, you just kind of know. And I'm like... How? So, okay, I talked to the, the, to the engineer who was previously delivering the project, and he said, oh yeah, 30 minutes, max. Absolutely, don't worry about it. I go to some of the other team members and they say, oh no, it should be fine in 10 minutes. And I'm like, okay, but what do I tell to the support people? W what do we tell the customers? I'm like, all right, okay. I just put my finger in the air. That's pretty much how it needs to be by the sound of it. Everybody has different ideas. So, yeah. And then it came the cherry on top of the cake, the scheduled deadline. Well, it turns out that had been agreed before I even started on the project. So, not only had I had to go through the planning all over again for the project, um, and learn everything from, uh, from before. But there also already was a bit behind schedule too, because uh, the project was supposed to be delivered, um, I think, uh, within two months, and uh, it's been already one month since it has been worked on, so I had one month to deliver it. It's like, okay, and I haven't even started looking at the tech stack yet. Okay. And then I had to think about who do I need to involve? Who, whose opinions matters? Well, I need the engineering department and the engineering people who actually worked on this, but I also need the support gang to let them know that, well, this product will be down and they need to inform customers. I mean, they'll be the one um, lasting any problems, if there are any. And they needed to arrange uh, uh, somebody to uh, cover up on the day of the migrations on, um, when we're going live to make sure that actually this product works after um, you're done. And actually the migration is successful. So 
kind of QA, kind of engineering. I needed all of those people. When you're new into an organization, trying to find those people, it's impossible. Uh, well, not impossible. It's very hard and very time consuming, which makes it almost impossible within the deadline that you have. So, okay, well, as you see, there are more boxes coming. Well, I've, I discovered what it means to have a project which is not under active development. Um, well, it means it's not important now. We're not gonna call it legacy because that has a bad vibe to it, really. Um, but not active sounds pretty good, right? It's, uh, it's safe to say that. Um, but it also means that it must have been around for a while. So most likely it doesn't have very good documentation, if any. And um, the other thing is there weren't any, many experts on it either because, well, it has been delivered a while ago. There's been some releases going on, but well, people come and go. So some knowledge has disappeared. And then, um, I started asking the questions, but okay, we're migrating this project. Can we actually make any improvements to it? Um, it turns out no, because time-wise that hadn't been scheduled in. And I'm like, but really? Really? But, 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 all of those buts, they'll make a little bit more sense after we go through a few slides later on. So, okay, at this point, I've um, started on the project planning. I've tried to coordinate people. Some of those balls have been rolling. Um, I've set them in motions. The emails have been done. Uh, so it means that I can actually focus on the things which need to be delivered. And the actual product in question involved, uh, was, was, as they said, fairly simple. It had a database layer, so the DB infrastructure. It was like, yeah, okay, fine, it's my SQL. I mean, I did my SQL at uni, right? That should be enough. No. Uh, uni would teach you how to create databases and tables and things like that, but it's not actually going to teach you how to set up replicas, how to set up users, grants, um, and even security groups to let the replicas talk to one another. Well, that was a new experience. And also added some time and effort to figure it out and asking person A, how would you do that? And then asking person B, and of course, everybody has a different opinion and everybody uses different tools, of course. Why would we make it easy? And then, okay, database, database, we've done it. Or you think we've done it, everything's replicating, it's fairly stable, backups are in place. Whew, okay, I can focus on the web tier. I mean, that should be fairly easy, right? We should have automation. Well, well we are using Ansible. Um, there are roles for this, except one little caveat. This is not an active project. Therefore, yeah, the automation for it is written, but what about the coverage of it? And who has the answers? Okay, and then we move to the layer which I was like, I'm, I'm comfortable with this. I mean, I'm, I'm coming from development background. Um, application layer should be easy, right? I mean, should be fairly straightforward, except it's not an application I've written. So trying to understand what they meant, well, and the PHP application, not so easy. And that's when I realized that we have to work together, development and operations, the developers who had released the feature the last time, and myself trying to find out, okay, well, what are the requirements for this? We are gonna be changing databases, we're gonna be changing hosts. How is this whole thing put together? So this was my simple project, which I got given. So that is meant two in my job. And I was scratching my head, and wondering, what can go wrong here? Shall we get started? Ah, oh, the first one. Got too much of your team involved. Well, if you ask uh, one person for an opinion, and you're like, okay, that makes sense, and then you decide to go to the next person. Oh, what do you think about that problem? 
and at the end you end up with, well, seven people, seven different opinions, of course, of how something would happen or should happen. And then sifting further through to find out the best solution. Not the easiest thing. And um, a lesson I learned the hard way. And then databases. I'm not a DBA. I'm, I'm, I, I was a simple Java developer. I was doing release uh, management as well. But I had no experience with MySQL on the level that it required for this project. So yeah, setting up replicas and setting them up across uh, different environments and different territories and dealing with lag, that was new. That was very new. And uh, breaking replication because you hadn't considered which uh, IP you have to be using for the host when you're setting up your grants. Well, <clears throat> another surprise, shall I say. Oh, and then it's great. I mean, okay, you've cracked the, the, the database layer, but then you have the vendors when you realize actually that um, you have to deal with them. Um, I didn't have to do it before. I mean, I never thought what, what would be the difference between dedicated and cloud and uh, why would, uh, well, I knew the difference, but I didn't know that dedicated, for an example, takes much longer uh, when, you, when you try to set it up. It's like, okay, okay, the lessons you learn. And then, well, you think you can automate stuff, but then you realize, well, this product is going after multiple vendors, so, well, is it AWS? Is it Azure, Cloud, Rackspace, even? Yeah, um, they do still exist. Um, so yeah, I had to deal with that, and I had no experience whatsoever with that. And then you find out about the poor infrastructure design. So as a developer, I rarely think if uh, my application is actually um, on the same host as my database. It's not something I think about. Um, to me, it doesn't really matter, or at least, I didn't have to think about it as much. But then with this project, I had the joy of finding out that yes, web and DB were together. And I, just, and I was like, okay, um, why is that bad? And then only when they started the actual migration, I found out. Yeah, designs in, in, in development are certainly different from the designs patterns expected in infrastructure. Learn the hard way. And then change. Trying to make too many changes at the same time and don't record which one is the one which fixed the problem. That happened a couple of times. And then, oh, but, but how, 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 what do you do the next time? I was like, well, I don't know. Do we repeat the exercise? So yay, joy, the changes. And then I realized that, yeah, having a hand, handed over project is actually a minus than a plus. In the beginning, I was like, yes, it's awesome. Somebody has already sorted out the hard work. But in reality, it meant that I, have to, I had to do everything all over again because, well, I actually wanted to talk to these people myself. I mean, to get to know them. So that doubled some time there. And yeah, I needed to um, uh, collaborate and communicate with all those people. And it was, it's hard. Those are hard things to do. Um, and then you find out all of the dependencies in your project. So in my case, um, I had a dependency on one particular engineer. It was lovely. Um, so he was the only one who can answer my question. Every, everything pointed to him. So, okay, great. I would, I would send him a message saying, hey, do you have five minutes to quickly discuss this? And I got, yeah, give me five minutes. And that happened for a whole week. Yeah, that delayed the project with another week. Because... Yay, people, you find out that um, 
Sometimes um, infrastructure projects can be less important in some people's eyes. Joys. And then the tools. Okay. Oh. Oh, where should I start on this one? Um, when you ask somebody, oh, what do you use when you're doing your um, uh, MySQL uh, replication? If, like, some will say, oh, just do a MySQL dump, or I'm just gonna use Percona, or I'm just gonna use X, Y, and Z. Well, actually, the, choose the tools based on your experience, not other people's opinions. I mean, because uh, that otherwise can set you back. The tools should be there to help you, not, not to stop you or block you and add more time. Oh, and then we also have the application deployment mechanism. See, okay, we're getting near the, near the release time and we started looking at, okay, deploying the application and how, how is all of that things, all of those things done. Well, not, not under active development, fairly little documentation, um, and it turns out that, uh, yeah, the deployment was kind of incomplete. It was kind of prone to, f to failure too. Um, it had moments where you had to copy paste things to make them work, to, to get them to the boxes. And then you find out that the permissions are entirely wrong because, well, the script was written by the developers and we just didn't have access to the hosts. So we ended up writing, uh, hacking and slashing some scripts to get the permissions right. Because, well, no CICD pipeline here. I mean, this is old school. Oh, working in isolation. And then there was the constant pressure. Are we on time? How are we doing with this project? Are we gonna hit the date? I mean, we already told the customers uh, that this is the date that uh, the service is going to be down for 15 minutes. Um, are we gonna hit it? Are you gonna make it? I was like, relax, I don't know yet. <laughs> I was honest, which um, it turns out wasn't the best idea. And then the, the area which hurt me the most the automation bit. I mean, I love these things. This is the reason why I joined the, the, the team, right? And to realize that actually in the legacy, sorry, not under active development, it also means that your automation is in this state. It hurts. And not, not, not having time to actually improve it, it hurts double. And finding out that, yay, 80% of the, of, of the work has been done, 20% are left, but nobody knows what those 20% are. That was painful. It hurt me. And looking at it now, looking back, I'm realizing that if development and operations had worked together from day one, and it wasn't just me, 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 running the project. All of those gray dots, they would have been avoided because we would have managed to collaborate, communicate. We would have been able to resolve those. It kind of makes me sad. But it's also, it's a learning curve. It's a learning experience. So, the joys. And then, well, I wonder if, well, I'm sure everybody wonders what happened with that project. We had a make it or break it time. I was super nervous. And don't forget, we had to do it four times. Four different territories, four different time zones, including quite early in the morning and quite late at night, just to ensure that we have time. And the moment of truth comes. We hit production with the first one. It works, like a charm, no problems whatsoever. And I'm, I'm super happy, super excited. We go for number two. It's perfect, again, strike two, love it. And then, of course, it comes the third one. When you realize, no, we need to roll back. And then you look at your rollback plan and realize it's all to-dos. 
and you realize that you have to actually row forward somehow at, um, to, at uh, I think it was one o'clock in the morning. Not the most productive time of the day or night. So, yeah, it was truly make it or break it. But we made it. I mean, we rolled forward. We somehow managed to get it done. And the next day, it's, it's, all, it's all great until we come to work and realize that we had forgotten the monitoring <laughs> to switch it on. Yeah, it was, well, we had monitoring on the new hosts. I mean, I'm not the complete newbie here. But, well, we had silenced it while we were having the problems. We just forgot to unmute it. Luckily, and that is absolute pure sheer luck, Everything was fine. I was like, no alerts overnight. It was, it was brilliant. But, but since that moment on, that monitoring nightmare is like, I had nightmares about it for, for weeks after. Okay. And then the same day, I find out that actually there was this thing called on call. Well, what is that? I mean... That was my first time actually having to be on call. And I was like, oh, are you saying I'm not gonna have personal life for this whole week? And that I need to be available for uh, any problems within five minutes? But, but what about having a shower? That was an, a new experience. And then, what do you mean troubleshooting at two o'clock in the morning? Who does that? Can you just silence it or just, all to heal somehow? Um, not really. You actually had to have run books for that, but I mean, run books? Do you just turn the documentation you had for the project into a run book somehow? Oh, isn't that tied to all of those changes um, uh, which solutions you didn't um, actually write down properly? Yeah, that hard. And then, of course, you had the, some of alerts which made no sense. What do you mean that there is high load? Well, well, can you be a bit more specific? Well, no, it was actually, it required some digging. And that's when you, you realize that you had to be a little bit more specific with your alerting. You had to look at the logs or maybe just be a bit smarter about it. But I didn't realize that until, I mean, that point on. But overall, overall, looking at it, it was a victory. I mean, we were in production. I mean, the project was delivered. There were no complaints. It was within the time frames that um, the customers wanted and uh, that it, within the minimal time time specified to. Um, it was almost on time. I mean, I think we were only two weeks out. Almost. And then it also meant that our team was stronger, like my connections with the developers, with the uh, other engineers in my team, with the support gang. It was, I felt pretty good about it. It was like, okay, I've grown some friends now. It's, it's month three after all. But then, however, that did have several breakdowns on my part trying to wrap my head around, okay, replications and a replica of a replica, and trying to, to solve problems which I had no experience with before. Even if I had a mentor, it was still, it was still tough. And then uh, there was n almost no work-life balance for, the, for that period of time, which I only realized later on, and when I got five kilos from snacking. Who's been there? Yeah, I know, right? Dangerous. Okay, so that was pretty horrendous, honestly. But overall, looking at the lessons, there, there are quite a few good ones here. I hope that, to go through with them with you. But month one to month six, it's four, five most likely. And what actually did I learn from all of this? And what am I still using as a, do not do this again? Fitting in, get to know your team. 
I mean, yeah, it's you you join a new team, um, and you get a mentor, but you actually need to learn how to work with everybody else, not only your mentor. So you have seven people's team, make sure you pair up with each one of them, because if you don't, then working together at two o'clock in the morning, trying to debug something, and you realize that um, you're not familiar with that person's style, uh, it's not the best experience. And yeah, just rotate, mix up. And practice problem solving together. <laughs> because, well, one of my colleagues, he can be um, a little bit short, like a little bit almost snippy, but it's just his style. It's, it's nothing personal. So we were like, it, it, it took some getting used to, and it would have been great if I had known this earlier on. Um, before I, I, I put some questions into my head, does he not like me? So yeah, get to know your team. And then understand the job. <laughs> um, what is expected from you? Is it releases? Is it infrastructure operations? There are so many things you might be doing because everything has the same label. And it's uh, only, it's, it's, you find out the details only when you start the job. And then the workflow. I mean, are you using, what are you using when you're working? Are you using uh, Spring-based developments, Scrums, Kanban? It's like, get a few of it and make sure you understand it before you propose some changes. <laughs> because, yeah, you might not have all the scenarios. Um, don't forget to present the unique view of the problem, your unique view. I mean, I come from a Java development, so um, yeah, from development in general, and uh, I, I had different insights and different ideas compared to some of uh, my team members who were coming more from a sysadmin background. And diversity is a key here, just don't be scared to voice it out. Proving yourself from the start isn't everything. Um, that is more true than you can believe, at least for me. Um, we're all human, uh, and it's very easy to forget and be harsh on people. Um, so, yeah, be nice. Is, be, be nice to yourself and to your colleagues. Um, that is probably one of the hardest things. Um, project planning lessons. Understand the application and the infrastructure before you say, yes, I'm going to do it. Before you commit to the project, make sure you know what you're signing up for. If somebody says, um, oh, can you take over a project now? I'm going to think deep and hard before saying yes. Ah, and make sure that there are some docs already. Because, yeah, trying to gather as much information as you can. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Well, it will work, which is just going to be very painful. Um, and think about who is the customer and what's the end goal of it. Um, what's the urgency? What's the priority of these things uh, before, um, before you kind of commit to a deadline? How flexible is that deadline, really? Um, give yourself as much time as you need, really. Um, and yeah, talk to, to, talk to the customer. Would, would that be your manager? Would that be um, a project manager? It doesn't matter. Just make sure that you have that information and that point of view. Oh, using the right tools for the job. Well, use the right tools, not the ones you want to use. Well, the reason why I'm saying that is, yeah, I would love to have used um, Terraform and make sure everything works perfectly, or that I, was, I really wanted to use some of the Percona Toolkit stuff, but in realization, it would have taken a lot longer to figure things out and how to, it's how to make it work with the legacy infrastructure, sorry, not under active development infrastructure. So yeah, that would have added some time. It's very tempting but sometimes we have to say no. Have a rollback plan, one which consists of uh, the steps required, not just a to-do, or I'm gonna write it later. And maybe have it tested too, you know? 
see if it works or not, rather than being all hypothetical. Oh, involving the right people. Um, in reality, anybody who is affected should be involved. I'm not saying on a per permanent basis, uh, but they should be aware that this thing is happening. Would that be uh, your sport? Would that be your uh, um, product? Would that be um, your engineering department? They, they should be involved from day one so they know and they can prioritize. And yeah, collaborate with them. I mean, it's gonna make your life easier. Despite it, it's one of the hardest things to do. And communicate left, right, and center. The reason why I'm adding this is because if you don't do it, and if you don't schedule a time in your diary every week to, to, to send all of the emails and updates that you have to do, somebody, it's, it's Murphy's Law, somebody's gonna send you an email at the worst possible timing demanding an update. That happened. It's not fun. When you're in the middle of resolving that incident and rolling forward, trying to, to, to answer an email, um, when was uh, this supposed to be live again? Yes. I found out it helps booking a slot. Even if it's just 15 minutes, would that be Monday morning or Friday afternoon or whatever times you want? Yeah, book it off, because otherwise it will never happen. Okay, I'm almost done, I promise. And from all the failures that we went through, um, infrastructure design is different from um, software, um, from the, the design patterns used in development. In development, you care about, uh, okay, is this, uh, uh, what's the cost of this algorithm, how fast it is, but from infrastructure point, the designs are different. Well, when you're, when you're changing a job, it makes sense to have a look at what the patterns are there, right? Well, I didn't, so that's why this is on the, point, on, on the list. This tool is too hard. I really, really wanted to use a tool because, well, my, my colleagues are advising me to do it. I mean, this is somebody who um, has experience. Um, they, they know what they're talking about. Well, well, with somebody with 20 years of experience, that might be the right tool. It doesn't mean it's my tool. So tools are there to make your life easy, not hard. Get to know your vendors. What are the differences between them? And what, what can one provide and the other one doesn't? And how you, defining security groups in AWS might be different to some of the other providers that you're using. Uh, case automation. So the case principle is an American thing from I think the 60s, correct me if I'm wrong, which says, keep it simple, stupid. But from automation perspective, what we really care is keep it small and simple. Don't try to refactor everything. And uh, try to, if, if you find out that the particular um, uh, playbook or a particular piece of work needs to be refactored, stick it to the backlog. Don't try to fit it into this project, because otherwise the mess is gonna be even bigger. Don't forget that you're not alone. You have a team, you uh, have an organization, hopefully behind you, um, you have a community, um, and you have friends who might be able to help you with the problems that you're, you're facing. So don't be afraid to reach out. And decide how much of your team you're going to involve in any of the decisions that you're making. I made the mistake of involving all, everybody. Um, if I have, been, uh, if I have uh, selected only one of them, that would have been uh, preferable. It would have saved me time. Uh, and it would have made the, less of, uh, the, the rest of the team less annoyed when I didn't follow their um, opinion. And don't forget the bird's eye view of the problem. I mean, you, you're focusing on, okay, I need to deliver this, but you're forgetting the end goal at the end. So try, trying to not lose focus, it's difficult. Okay, victory isn't all. This is my last slide, I promise. The technical curve when you're moving from development to operations is very steep, so you have to pick your battles. You won't be able to do everything. Um, so pick wisely, because otherwise you're gonna overwhelm yourself. Um, Document your solutions on time and while they're happening and, and make sure that uh, you have the documentations, the runbooks, um, 
and that you've tested things before you commit, yes, this will work. Um, it, it might also mean that you find out things which need to be addressed in the backlog or that will need to be turned into side projects. Just document them, link them, have them somewhere. Change is hard. Um, it requires time, time, communication and perseverance. Um, it's easy to change um, the tech, but it's harder to change the way a team works. Um, introducing new stuff all the time can make the team overwhelmed and they're going to just boycott you. Don't do that. Everything is awesome when you're part of a team. Um, again, teamwork needs time. You need to build up that connection with your team members to know how they work and to know how you can work together. Um, the team is your safety net, really. When something goes wrong, when you can't take it anymore, you've had like five hours of trying to deal with an incident and you need help. This is your life and your health. Uh, th this for me is really important because I went through uh, several breakdowns through that project. Uh, any, uh, you need to be able to take a step back um, and don't be hard on yourself when something's not going right. Um, mental health is not a joke. And in situations like mine, um, yes, it's very easy to feel like an impost imposter. We're not even talking about an imposter syndrome here. I am an imposter. I mean, I joined uh, operations uh, two months before, having, uh, before starting this project. So I was extra hard on myself and uh, my health took uh, some hits on that one. Communicate, left, right, and center. You have heard that one already. And collaborate. It's important, it will save you time. And it's difficult, I know. And sometimes we're extroverted, introverted, it doesn't really matter. We're just trying to do the best job of our lives because you don't know when what, and what happens. So just be proud of what you do. So yeah. That's me. Thank you.